In this video, we're going to review four common operational amplifier configurations. The four we're going to look at very briefly and just review are the, in, the non-inverting configuration or the non-inverting amplifier, the voltage follower or buffer amplifier, the inverting amplifier, and then the summing amplifier. Now, we could analyze each of these different circuits by summing the currents associated with the inverting terminal or summing the currents at the inverting terminal. But we did that in the previous video where we derived this expression, which gave us the output voltage in terms of the V2, which was the voltage connected to the non-inverting terminal, V1, which was the voltage connected to the inverting terminal, and the resistors in the circuit around it. So we've got this equation, and rather than going through and rederiving each of these relationships, let's just show how this equation leads us to the output-input relationships for each of these four different common configurations, starting with the non-inverting amplifier. You'll notice in the non-inverting amplifier, V1 has been shorted out, or V1 has been turned to zero. So with V1 equaling zero, we're left then with the equation for the, the non-inverting that V out is equal to R2 over R1 plus 1 times V2. And this quantity right here is known as the closed loop gain for the non-inverting amplifier. The output will equal this input voltage V2 times the ratio of the two resistances plus one. Alrighty, now let's take a look at the voltage follower or the buffer amplifier. Here you'll notice that not only is V1 equal to zero, but R2 has been replaced with a short circuit, so R2 equals zero, and R1 is effectively infinite. So we have here then 0 divided by infinity, that's definitely 0. V1 is 0, and for the voltage follower or the buffer amplifier, we get that V out is just equal to V1. Now that may not sound particularly interesting. The output is just what the input was, and that's exactly right. Well, why would we do such a thing? Well, this buffer or voltage follower is useful in a couple of different situations. It's particularly useful when the source that we're wanting to amplify has a particularly high equivalent output resistance, or that the source resistance, the Thevenin resistance of this amplifier is particularly high. So that drawing any current at all from the source would cause a significant drop in the voltage and if this is a relatively small voltage with a large impedance or large resistance, what little bit of signal we have will be lost internally through the internal resistance if we draw any current or any um, substantial amount of current. So the input to the terminal here sees an infinite resistance. The current going in there is zero. We have a virtual short here, so whatever the voltage is here is going to be this. There's no current being drawn from it, so that there will be no voltage drop. And in fact, this V sub P will equal the source voltage there. Now, because of the virtual short, then, this voltage here equals this voltage here. And because there's no resistance, and even if there was resistance, actually, because there's no current going into here, there would be no voltage drop between the inverting terminal and the output. So the output voltage equals whatever the voltage is on the inverting terminal, and due to the virtual short, the voltage on the inverting terminal is the same as the voltage on the non-inverting terminal. And because there's no current going into here, the voltage at the non-inverting terminal will be exactly the signal voltage that we're wanting to see or be able to use. So this buffers this, I should say, buffers this and gives us an output voltage that's the same as that. But not only is it the same voltage, but we now have full advantage of the output current capabilities of the amplifier. And as we've mentioned already, typical op-amp current capabilities or 
common specifications or common specs for the output current of an amp, op amp are on the order of 10 milliamps to maybe 30 or 40 milliamps. That may not sound like a whole lot, but it's enough to be to drive additional circuitry, whereas this original source may not have had that capability. So the first situation we would use this is when there's a large source resistance. The second common application for this type of a circuit is when the source of the signal has particularly small current capabilities, or maybe not have any current capabilities at all. Many sensors provide only a voltage difference and have really no source of power. They're able to give a voltage separation, but because there's no real power capabilities, they're not able to produce any measurable current at all. Under those circumstances with limited current, the amplifier then can provide up to 10 or 20 or 30 milliamps of current at the same voltage. Thus, this amplifier is also sometimes referred to as a current amplifier. The next common configuration we're going to look at is the inverting amplifier. And we know this is the inverting amplifier because our signal source, V1, is applied to the inverting terminal. And the non-inverting terminal is tied to ground. So V2 then equals zero. And we're left with simply V out is equal to negative R2 over R1 times V1. And once again, let's just point out that in this, in this configuration, there is a minus sign, that the output voltage has the opposite sign as the input voltage, and it's scaled by the ratio of R2 over R1. And from this, we see that this gain term R2 over R1, or negative R2 over R1, is the closed loop gain for the inverting amplifier. Now, this final configuration that we're going to look at is known as the summing amplifier. In this configuration, both V1 and V2 are connected to the inverting terminal, and the non-inverting terminal is tied to ground. So V here, let's just call it V sub P, the voltage at the non-inverting terminal is equal to zero, which means that the voltage at the non-inverting terminal, V sub N, because the virtual short, it equals V sub P, which equals zero. Now, let's go ahead and write the node equation at the inverting terminal. Now we've got current here, we've got current there, and current there. Of the four branches, of course, the current going into the op amp itself is zero, but we have these other three terms. So those three terms must add to zero. Those three terms are going to be the voltage here, which we've already said is going to be zero, minus V1, so zero, minus V1 divided by R1, plus zero minus V2 divided by R2 plus zero minus V out divided by R sub F. We're, del we're naming this R sub F as the feedback resistor. The sum of those three terms must equal zero. Now, we've got this negative E out over RF. Let's take it to the other side and let's just clean this up a little bit. And we've got V out over R sub F is equal to negative V1 times 1 over R1 minus V2 times 1 over R2. Now, let's pull out this minus sign. Let's multiply both sides by R sub F. And we have then V out is equal to negative times the quantity V1 times R sub F over R1 plus, again, I factored the negative sign out, plus V2 times R sub F over R2. So what we have here, of course, there's the inversion sign because they're connected to the inverting terminal. But other than for that, factoring that out, 
we have V1 multiplied by some scalar plus V2 multiplied by another scalar. This configuration will take and add scaled versions of those two input val uh, voltages, voltages or signals. If we want them to experience the same gain, we make R1 equal to R2, and then we have that V out is equal to negative R sub F, we'll just call it R1, but R1 equals R2. So if R1 equals R2, V out will equal negative RF over R1 times V1 plus V2, hence the name summing amplifier.